Um, thanks so much, everyone, for, for logging on. I know this was short notice, um, but hopefully we can bring in a bit of entertainment to your lockdown. I think this is the first bird club talk that I've given in slippers. So <laughs> I hope everyone's comfortable at home. Um, I'm just going to mute everybody's microphones so that um, we don't have any interruptions. Um, but at the end of the, the end of the presentation, I will provide time for you guys to be able to ask questions. Um, great. Okay, so I put up my title slide there. I'm sure some of you have had a chance to read that. So I'm going to move on into the presentation. Um, just to give you a bit of background on who I am. So I started off with Bird Life back in 2017. I started off as an intern. I just completed my PhD and was looking for some experience in the bird conservation world. I'm actually a savannah ecologist by training. So I worked on uh, savannah trees for my PhD and looking at how leaves come on and off. But I've always been a passionate bird watcher. And my hope was that when I joined Bird Life, I would be able to marry those two sort of parts of my life and bring my ecology knowledge to being able to save South Africa's birds. And so I sit here today having come through the ranks of bird life as the, an intern and then the raptor and large terrestrial bird project manager, where I did some of the work I'm going to show you this evening. And I, as of January this year, have now taken the reins of all of our terrestrial species work. So I'm now heading up our landscape conservation program. Those of you who are familiar with bird life will probably know that we didn't have a landscape conservation program. This is a brand new program and um, started on in January this year. Um, we basically combined the former terrestrial bird conservation program with the IDA program. So we're taking our sites and our species work and combining the two to have a much more effective and synergistic um, projects and sort of conservation modus operandi. So on to the Southern Banded Snake Eagles. The beauty of being in the virtual world is that I'm about to transport all of you to Northern Zululand and uh, hopefully get you outside of the four walls that you're all locked down in at the moment. So without any further ado, let's get going. Okay, so just for some of you that are on the line who might not know um, what bird life is or what we do, very briefly, um, we are the only NGO in South Africa that is completely focused on the conservation of birds and their habitats. And we do this through using scientifically based programs um, and also making sure that people are encouraged to enjoy nature. So our entire purpose in South Africa is to make sure that we preserve our birds, their natural habitats, and the bird watchers who go out there and enjoy both of those things. Um, we're part of a wonderful partnership. There, it's called the Bird Life International Partnership. There are over 120 country partners. And together we make up the biggest conservation partnership in the world. And what's really great about being part of this partnership is that all the work that we do as Bird Life South Africa is really translatable through our partnership networks. And that way we can have a more regional impact through the BirdLife Africa Partnership as well as the BirdLife International Partnership. And we can teach as well as receive lessons from other partners around the world and hopefully together strengthen our conservation cause. Now, the Terrestrial Bird Program, which I used to work for when I did the Southern Mountain Snake Eagle work, was a sort of direct branch of the Preventing Extinctions Program, which is a BirdLife International concept. And their real main aim of this program is to stop our threatened bird species from going extinct. Now, in 2015, BirdLife South Africa produced the ESCOM Red Data Book for Birds. This was a really big milestone in terms of understanding the conservation landscape of our bird species. Um, we're overdue for a new red, red list book and we're busy negotiating with ESCOM to hopefully fund the 2020 red list, but we'll keep our fingers crossed as to whether or not we managed to pull that off. Um, but essentially what we learned out of this 2015 exercise was that of our 132 odd threatened species in South Africa, bird species, we're looking at a quarter of our raptor species falling into threatened categories. And when I talk about threatened categories, we're talking about the extinction scale. So the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, 
has a scale that is essentially a barometer for understanding how likely a species is to go extinct. Now, the species which fall into this critically endangered category are ones which are the most likely to go extinct in the near future. And unfortunately, in South Africa, we're sitting on six critically endangered raptors. Four of those are vulture species, uh, the hooded vulture, white-backed vulture, the white-headed vulture. And then we've also got two raptors, so your tighter falcon, which is in the top left of those photographs, and then the southern banded snake eagle. Now, the southern banded snake eagle is a beautiful, cryptic, forest-dwelling um, raptor. It lives in the coastal forests of northern KwaZulu Natal. And as you can see in this photograph here, it relies mainly on reptiles and amphibians for its food source. Approximately 80% of the prey that it takes is reptiles and amphibians. And you can see the one in the top left there has a vine snake in its claws. And this is one of the main species of snake that these birds prey on. The one in the middle of the bigger picture is eating a frog. And they will also come down and, and eat amphibians when they are struggling to find snakes. Now, these beautiful birds have a variety of different plumages. And I was just acknowledge Hugh Chittenden for um, providing me with these images. Hugh's done some amazing work on the species over the years and has collected some of the only known data in terms of their plumage. Now, what you see in the top left of your screen is a beautiful first year bird. When these birds hatch, they burrow into these first year birds that have that beautiful white plumage with a bit of pale brown flecking and dark wings. In their second year, they go completely dark. So you can see there that bird has very little barring on its chest, um, and the gray on its wings is just starting to come through. From there, they molt into their sub adult plumage. You can see here a slightly scruffier version of. Um, the beautiful adults that we've all come to know and love. And um, those sub-adult birds slowly bring in more and more barring onto their chests and then ultimately become adult birds. Now we don't know what the exact time frame is that these birds move from their second year plumage into their adult plumage. The estimation is between three to five years. Um, but unfortunately, because they're so secretive and difficult to monitor, we haven't been able to, to nail that down just yet. But hopefully as this project expands, uh, we'll be able to, to get an answer to that. Now, this is the beautiful coastal forest and grassland of northern Kwazulu Natal. You can see um, the map at the top right there, that very thin blue sliver um, where the arrow is pointing is our Indian Ocean coastal belt. Now, for those of you who do not have an ecology background, here's a quick ecology 101. South Africa is broken up into several different biomes. A biome is simply an area that is quantified by the vegetation that dominates. So you'll be familiar with the term the grasslands or the savanna. Grasslands are obviously dominated by grasses. Your savannas are a mix of trees and grass. And then, of course, we've got the Indian Ocean coastal belt. Now, a lot of this coastal belt has these beautiful um, coastal forests along those big dunes, as you can see on the ridge there. And they are backed up by these shallow grassland areas. Now, southern banded snake eagles occur on this sort of ecotone. What they do is they breed and roost inside those forests, and then they will come out and hunt along the edges. And if you have a look there in these pictures here, you can see a bird roosting in the forest during the peak heat of the day, as well as a breeding pair of southern banded snake eagles. And I must just note here. These two images are some of the only documented images of breeding southern banded snake eagles in southern Africa. Uh, we know of only four nest sites in South Africa, and there's a couple more in Zimbabwe that we know about. But in terms of understanding the breeding ecology of this species, we know very little. And I'm going to introduce you to our new raptors and large terrestrial birds project manager later on, who will hopefully be helping us answer some of these questions as we move forward and try and understand the species a bit better so that we can improve its conservation. When they're not roosting and breeding inside these big forests, you'll see these birds on the edges of the coastal forest. So you can see this bird perched low on a shrub watching below it. They have extremely good eyesight and they will watch for any movement below them of a snake or a lizard or a frog and they will then drop down and eat it. 
So early on in the morning, to those of you who've had the opportunity to go and knock around northern Zululand, may have seen these birds out in the, the bright morning sun. That is one of the best times to try and, and connect with the species, is early in the morning. So as I said, they are patient perch hunters, and you will spot them high up on a snag, and they love dead eucalyptus trees. Unfortunately, they also love large electrical poles that they can perch on and watch for prey, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Once they spot the prey coming past, they will then dive down and grab it. As you can see, this adult bird dispatching the snake very quickly, getting rid of that head, making sure that the venom is out of the way, and they will then proceed to eat the rest of the body of the snake. Really talented um, snake catching raptors. Now, if we look at the global distribution of the species, you'll see the yellow creeping up the eastern side of the African continent. They are a really restricted species when it comes to the types of habitats that they are able to occupy. So you'll see down in the bottom near South Africa and southern Mozambique, there's a little sliver there. And then from northern Mozambique, stretching up through East Africa and finishing up in southern Somalia, this is where you are likely to find these birds. Um, now, unfortunately, if we look at their global um, IUCN red list standing, they are currently estimated to have fewer than 2,000 birds. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this assessment was done in 2004. That is approximately 15 odd years ago, and a lot has changed in Africa since then. We've seen large-scale deforestation and huge expansion of development throughout that eastern corridor, and that is putting huge pressure on these birds. So the population estimate of 672,000 has likely changed quite a bit. Closer to home in South Africa, our more recent estimate, and I must stress that both of these are just estimates, I'll speak to that a little bit later. We are looking at around 40 to 50 mature individual birds. Now, something that our Raptor Large Terrestrial Bird Project Manager is going to be looking at is whether we can scientifically and accurately quantify just how many birds we have left here in South Africa. But as it stands, our current estimates are that we have 50 mature adult birds in South Africa, which is extremely concerning when we're trying to conserve the species here at home. But the reality is, as I said, these are just estimates and there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of research to be done in order to back up these robust um, population estimates. So watch this space and hopefully we can chat to you in another year or so's time with a slightly more refined population estimate and hopefully one that tells a slightly more positive story. I mentioned the expansion of development across Africa. What you see here is a, an estimate from a group led by Professor Hansen, and he has shown that from 2001 to 2018, everywhere where you see pink on this map is an area where forest has been reduced in South Africa. So if we have a look at the Southern Man and Snake Eagles distribution, you can see large swags, particularly through Mozambique and into Tanzania, where forest loss has um, occurred within the Southern Man and Snake Eagles range. And this is a little bit what it looks like. So, you know, the familiar beautiful coastal forests of northern Zuliland, and the picture on the right of your screen is what modern day Richards Bay currently looks like. I took this photograph standing in the Insulani Nature Reserve, which is one of the few remaining protected areas that has secured any form of coastal forest and grassland in that entire northern Zuliland region. So, habitat transformation is a serious threat for the species. And we're working very hard to ensure that what little habitat does remain is secured. Now, across northern Zululand and the whole of Kuzina Natal, what you see here is some of the habitat transformation that has taken place. A colleague of mine, when I was still studying at BITS, did a PhD looking at habitat transformation across uh, KwaZulu Natal. And what you see in that top left map is everywhere that is in black is an area that has been transformed for human agriculture or human settlement, or some form of human activity. So back in 1994, the dawn of democracy in South Africa, we were sitting at around 73% natural habitat for Southern Africa, or for KwaZulu Natal. By 2011, that had reduced down to 53%. And what I'd like you to notice is that the majority of this transformation has taken place along the coast which is prime habitat for southern banded snake eagles. The more colourful map you can see on the right-hand side of your screen 
is just highlighting some of the land use types that we find across Kozunan and Tal. You'll see over here, this big weird black shape in the middle is Kluhui and Pelosi National Park. And up on the right hand side here is your Isimangaliso wetland heritage site. So those are two of the few remaining protected areas within northern KwaZulu Natal. And then we have a few private uh, nature reserves such as Pinda and the Mpuzi Nature Reserve as well, protecting a few spots here. Everywhere that you see in purple is a plantation of some form or another. Everything in red is sugarcane, and all of the yellow and peach are areas where human settlements have expanded. So we've really seen a transformative landscape in this northern KwaZulu Natal region. And a lot of that is concentrated on monocultures, such as forestry and agriculture. Unfortunately, what this means is that our birds, our southern mountain snake eels, are being pushed off the edge into hopefully what won't be extinction. And so back in 2015, a team led by Andrew Jenkins and David Allen set out into Northern Cosinantil on behalf of BirdLife South Africa to start understanding the landscape that these southern man and snake eagles were trying to survive in. And so they headed off and did some incredible um, networking and understanding some of the role players within that landscape, but the sort of base was set for a research project to be launched. And that's what's happened since then. So in 2016, Dr. Shane McPherson was hired as a full-time researcher on the Southern Man and Snake Eagle project. Shane headed out into the Vitsunzini region, which is one of the strong, um, strongholds for the species. Those of you who don't know where Mtinzini is, it's about two hours north of Durban. And Shane did some absolutely groundbreaking work on the species within Mtinzini. He did some incredible monitoring and really got to understand the three pairs of birds that occur within this landscape of coastal forest and plantation that surrounds Mtinzini. But one of the absolute key things that Shane was able to find was what the fourth and only known nest of Southern Man and Snake Eagles in South Africa. And so if you have a look at that Google Earth image on the left side of your screen, the blue dot is where Shane was sitting and the white circle is where the nest was found. Shane observed a bird flying in and you can see the vertical arrow pointing downwards. That's a bird perching on a stick very close to the nest and Shane managed to watch him fly in and swap over with the female who, if you look at the top of your screen, is perched on the nest over there. You can see the little grey outline really outlining her. Now this was a groundbreaking discovery because up until this point, we thought that Southern Man and Snake Eagles were largely restricted to protected areas, places like Isimangalis or Wakeland Reserve where many birds are sighted and some of the gardens around that um, St. Lucia region. We'd never before detected them in these plantation landscapes and when Shane handed the project over, one of the key things that he wanted us to look into was how are these Southern Man and Snake Eagles adapting to these sort of fake forested landscapes? Are they persisting within the forestry network? And can the forestry network actually provide some form of alternative hand, uh, landscape for these birds to persist in a changing world? Now, when Shane handed the, the project over to me back in uh, 20, 2018, we had to start looking at a plan for this project. And what I'm going to show you now is, is sort of the overall project plan, but I'm only going to talk to two or three of these objectives this evening. So one of the first things we needed to ask was, where are these birds? And how we go about trying to understand that is by gathering a range of data from different citizen sciences, scientists. We're also collecting um, annual Southern Man and Snake Eagle survey data. And we're hoping to deploy telemetry devices. Unfortunately, we were meant to leave on the 18th of April to go down to Northern Zululand and put our first tracking devices. But COVID had other plans for us. So as soon as we are free to move again, we will hopefully be going down and fitting these birds with tracking devices for the first time. What we can do with all of this data is start to understand things like their economic, ecological niche, as well as their distributions. We've got very clever teammates at BirdLife South Africa who do some incredible species modeling, and I'm going to show you some of that a little, a little bit later. We can really start using that to understand where we should be focusing our conservation efforts on the ground in terms of trying to protect these birds. The other thing we needed to look at was how many of these birds are left. And so in order to try and do that, we need to start considering our survey data, 
hopefully putting up some camera traps at nests where we ultimately try and find them thanks to our tracking data, and also looking at potential threats. What could be reducing the population outside of just habitat loss? And so when we combine both of these things, we can start to work with role players in the environment, the likes of forestry as well as ESCOM, who are potentially causing an, electric, uh, an electrocution threat to these birds with some of their infrastructure. And the two things that I'm going to talk to you about this evening are our ecological niche and species distribution models that we've been developing, as well as a threat analysis looking at the impact of transformer boxes on southern mammoth snake eagles and the potential electrocution risk that these devices pose to our birds. So in terms of answering this question of where they are and what the possible maximum extent of occurrence could be throughout South Africa, we started off by gathering as much uh, citizen science data as we could. We were very kindly offered access to the African Raptor database. We also collected um, the bird NASA data points that people had collected over the last few years. And we collected all records from eBird, e as well as the Global Biodiversity Information Forum. And so with these different um, citizen science um, points that we could collect, we could start looking at where these birds are being seen, and we can use that to inform our modeling exercise. Now, I just want to stress, what you're seeing here are all of the records that have been collected post-2000. We're not interested currently in looking at where these birds were historically. We know that they've had a big range contraction, and we know that a lot of these birds um, are no longer found where they used to be found. And so what you're seeing here is essentially the modern day records from the last 20 years of data that we could collect. The next thing we need to start doing is cleaning out this data. So occasionally someone's logged a bird in Cape Town when they were sitting on their couch because they remembered that they saw it. And that GPS point obviously is not a realistic one. We need to then remove it from the data. And this is a process called rarification. So we clean out all of the data points. And what we needed to do was, in order to not bias our model, we have to start eliminating some of the areas where we get high monitoring rates. So somewhere like Kissimmee or Wetland Park, where many, many people go and many people log the bird, we get a very big cluster of data. And that unfortunately can skew our models if we're starting to see too many points lighting up in one particular place. So to try and get around that, what we do is a process called rarification. And what that allows us to do is to take a random point, and we space them at three kilometers apart, because this is the estimated territory size of a southern mammoth snake eagle. And we can then start to get a spread of sort of realistic territories for southern mammoth snake eagles around northern Kuzidan Atoll. Now, just as an aside, something we're looking into is that on this map, we're sitting with around 93 territories of southern mammoth snake eagles. Now, obviously, not all territories will be occupied at the same time, but hopefully through understanding which of these territories is active and when, we can start to get a much more realistic population estimate. But that's some science for a later time. So we've got our raw data ready to go into the model. What we now need to start doing is understanding what environmental factors influence the southern mammoth snake eagle. We start off with a layer, a whole range of layers to do with climate. So we can look at things like your average annual temperature, your minimum temperatures in winter, how wet things get in summer. There's a whole different um, category of weather types and climate types that we can start to build into these models. The next layer we add to this is topography. So we need to understand things like elevation, slope, what, uh, which direction the slope is facing, that can have an impact as well as drainage and hydrology, so where water is potentially flowing through an area. And then we bring in the last layer of environmental variables, which is your land cover data. Now this is things like land use, so I showed you earlier, we know where the plantations are, we know where the human settlements are. We can also bring in things like soil type or types of agriculture, and we can start to use all of these to really build an idea of what the Southern Man and State Eagle is choosing from its environment. I'm not going to go into the complication of exactly how we do that in terms of the maths, but all you need to know is that at an absolute broadest scale, if we just look at the climate variables of Southern Man and State Eagles, we can already see everywhere in the dark blue is your sort of hot zone for the species. We're already seeing a tendency for these birds to be located on the coastal areas of Southern Africa. 
So from a, a very, very broad perspective, just taking into account climate, we know these birds like it hot and they like it wet. So that's why Northern Zulu is the perfect place for them. But we need to obviously take our models a little bit further and make them a little bit more informative for us. So not every single aspect of these environmental layers is going to tell us something valuable. So in order to declutter our models, we get rid of some of the layers that don't really have an influence. And then we can start creating an output that looks a little bit more like this. Now, this is an extremely fine scale output model for Southern Man Snake Eagles. What you're seeing here is a 30 meter resolution model for Southern Man Snake Eagle habitat. And you can see it is a very clear spine of suitable habitat moving up through um, Southern Africa. So once again, all of the really blue areas are very important um, sites for these birds. And everywhere that's in green could still potentially host Southern Man and Snake Eagles, but it's not as optimal as some of the more blue sites. So if we dig deeper into this model, what we find is that the absolute critical thing for these birds is that if we look at the minimum temperature of the coldest month, they like habitats that have a minimum temperature of 11 degrees Celsius or higher. These birds do not like it to get cold. They avoid areas where the temperatures drop below 11 degrees Celsius. They really like to be in warm climates. So that was a very strong um, contender in trying to understand where these birds occur. And another big factor was obviously land cover. They need those coastal forest type habitats or wooded habitats to be able to survive. Now, my colleague Robin Pillane is busy doing some absolutely incredible modeling, um, not just for South Africa, but Southern Africa. Southern Africa and Africa as well. And what you see here is Robin's models, which are at a slightly coarser um, scale. So these are at 100 meters, not 50 meters. But you can see once again, for Southern Banded Snake Eagles, a very, very hot zone. So here, everything that's in red is your best suitable habitats. And you can see Robin's models lighting up that coastal plain. Now, one of the great things about Robin's model is that he also builds in a climate change element. And we can see, that these birds have the potential to move southwards as climate starts to change and we move into a hotter world. We've seen how COVID has changed the world. We have no idea what's coming with climate change in 20 years. So it's very positive to see that these birds could potentially move south, providing that the habitat is there for them. So from a conservation point of view, we're very happy to see this potential. And we've received word that there is a pair of birds that have established on the border of the Eastern Cape and Southern Kwazulu Natal. So that's speaking very much to these birds being able to move southwards and we'll hopefully learn more, more about these birds um, that are moving southwards as we continue studying them. Now I mentioned the forestry landscape and the potential for these alternative landscapes to provide our Southern Banded Snake Eagles with suitable habitats. And what you see here is some of our model outputs um, on the right hand side is just showing you where those purple forestry landscapes are and then once again on the left hand side are 30 meter resolution models now something that is really important to have a look here is that these are not coming up um, as green these are coming up as blue areas which means there is a high level of suitability for southern man and snake eagles in these um, forestry landscapes and so we need to, needed to go out and start to ground truth this um, concept. And in 2018, I headed out with um, a very small team to go out and start doing a bit of ground truthing for Southern Band of Snake Eagles, specifically targeting these forested landscapes. Now this is the Northern Zululand region. Um, you can see Richards Bay, um, all the way down to Mtanzini in the south. Uh, we went into these different plantation blocks. We got permission from Mandy and Saki to go and do this work. All of the yellow tracks you can see are the routes that we took. We targeted the small natural pockets that sort of flow between these plantation landscapes. And we worked along them playing callback every five, 500 meters to see if we could get a response from a southern banded snake eagle. I'm just gonna show you some of the, the photos from that trip. So this was our team, um, Caroline Howes Wifer, some of you might know her. There was talk earlier of a European honey buzzard being seen. If you would like to hear all about honey buzzards, she's the lady to contact. And uh, Junior Fabella, who is one of the best community guides that BirdLife has ever produced. He knows that Northern Zululand region better than anybody I've ever been out with, and he was 
absolutely phenomenal. If you're ever in the Northern Zululand area and need someone to show you those birds, I cannot recommend Julia enough. He really, really was good and really helped us to locate these birds in these really tough um, forested landscapes. Of course, there's always occupational hazards. You gotta watch out for things like crocodiles when you're moving through these uh, Northern Zululand regions. But we had a lot of fun and we had some really good success finding these birds. And I'm just gonna play you the call now. Let me know if you can't hear that. So that is the, you can hear it. No, I don't think Not. we can hear it. Okay, cool, no worries. Side. Sorry, I don't know why that's not working. I can hear it in mine. But uh, we'll move on. It's uh, The Southern Man Snake Eagle call is quite unique. It's sort of a rah, 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 rah. <laughs> very, uh, very interesting call. And um, definitely one worth looking up on your Robert's app if you've never heard it before. So some of the other interesting things that we came across in these forested landscapes is um, some really wonderful creatures out um, along Isimangaliso, the Sia Kubeka forestry landscape. We came across buffaloes, rhinos, elephants, um, just about the entire big five cruising through these plantation landscapes. It's a bit of a, a weird mindset to come across a herd of buffaloes inside these eucalyptus plantations. But nevertheless, they were in there. And some really interesting birds too, some good raptors. Um, you can see the, the osprey over there, and we had breeding yellow bolt kites. Undoubtedly the best um, raptor sighting we had, other than our southern banded snake eagles, was this beautiful juvenile airs hawk eagle. And we've learned subsequently that there has been another nesting attempt in the um forestry landscape. So it looks like plantations might be pretty good for some of our raptor species going forward. So that's a, a plus on that front. Uh, just to show you some of the, the incredible species and diversity we came across. Most of the trip that we were um, down in Northern Zululand, we surveyed um, 22 pentads, and on those 22 pentads, we picked up 257 species, the majority of which were located in these forest pockets. So there is an untold uh, treasure of bird diversity going on um, around these plantations that we haven't really been aware of previously. Um, so that's very exciting to see. And we hope that those natural forest pockets that sort of snake their way through these forestry blocks are maintained by our forestry partners, which they seem committed to do. So that's very good news. Now on the Southern Mounted Snake Eagle front, we had some really exciting success. What you're seeing here is the Kwapadambi plantation block. So this is just outside of Richards Bay. All of the yellow square, or sorry, yellow circles, are places where we found at least one, if not two, southern banded snake eagles. So this is at least five confirmed territories of southern banded snake eagles in the heart of one of our plantation blocks. And that was an extremely exciting finding for us on this survey. And we're doing, hopefully doing some more extensive research to understand just how they're able to survive within these plantation landscapes going forward. I want to just zoom in to the territory that's in the bottom left of your screen right now. This is the um, Nsezi Dam. It borders onto the Enseleni River and uh, that flows past the Enseleni Nature Reserve, which is in the pale green at the top of your screen. And um, we were surveying in the Mondi plantations, which are over there. And um, you can see the little white uh, circle in the center of your screen. And we managed to find a pair of birds and they in the back of this plantation, this newly planted plantation landscape, you can see one of the last remaining pockets of natural forest. And these birds had managed to establish territory in there. They were calling together, displaying beautifully for us over this natural um, pocket of forest. And so they really are hanging in there and they were hunting along the edge of this um, forest section, using that newly cut open landscape to hunt. So there's definitely an adaptability element here for the species that we weren't previously aware of, which is very, very exciting. So when we start looking at whether these birds are adapting, there's a high maybe to positively yes, they could be, which is great. And in terms of trying to further their conservation, it really gives us a good tool set and a base to work from to protect these birds going forward. Now, one of the next steps that we need to look at is telemetry. Um, as I said, we were hoping to go down and fit tracking devices on these birds. 
Those of you who know your raptors will know that that is not a southern man snake eagle on the top right. That is actually a European honey buzzard, which I was privileged enough to go and watch getting tagged. Um, so hopefully you are going to do the same thing for the southern man and snake eagles um, in the near future and start to understand their fine scale movements. Telemetry is a wonderful tool because we don't have to try and follow these birds into the forest to see exactly where they are or how they're using their landscape. Those data points just get uploaded to an internet page and we can then access the data and understand exactly what they're up to without needing to be on the ground disturbing them. So it's a great tool and we're looking really forward to, to getting that data soon. Now I've mentioned some of the tricks to our, our African raptors, but some of the key ones, as I said, are linked to habitat loss. So that's your agriculture and logging in particular. But one of the other big threats to our raptors is that of energy and power line infrastructure. Now, one of the reasons that we think these birds are able to survive in this park, um, plantation landscape is because we've actually created the coastal forest and grassland matrix that they are now missing from their natural habitats. If you have a look at this plantation servitude, we've got beautiful poles for them to perch on and hunt. We've got the forest on the left, and then these nice grassy verges where they can catch things like lizards and frogs and snakes. So now all we need to do is make sure that these novel landscapes are safe for our birds. Now, if we have a look at these southern mannered snake eagles, they absolutely love to perch on poles. And things like electrical poles are really great perching poles for them. Now there's two problems with this. If this bird catches a snake, as you can see there, and flies in with its snake to that pole, if the snake touches that live wire and then touches the bird who is perched and perched on top of that pole, we have Kentucky Fried Chicken. And that is a huge problem. Likewise, when raptors defecate, they tend to squirt a streamer of feces, and that is a nice wet conductor of electricity if that feces happens to connect with the live wire. So there are two ways that these birds can get electrocuted on these poles. We also have been sent images like this, which really makes my blood run cold. This is a 440 kilowatt um, electrical pylon, and if that bird leans a little bit further forward and touches that wire going over its head, you probably won't even find a carcass that will incinerate into hot, fiery coals. So that is hugely concerning for us. But the real treacherous evil lurking in between all of our landscapes and, have, and uh, settlements are these transformer boxes. Now what you see in the bottom left of your screen is a young southern man snake eagle. You can see that pale white plumage. He is a first year bird. This is a bird that has just left his nesting site. He hasn't had a chance to breed or even really learn to be a southern man snake eagle. And he has unfortunately perched on top of a transformer box, as you can see in your picture on the screen. And he has touched one of the live wires and unfortunately been fatally electrocuted. Now these transformer boxes are a big problem, not just for raptors like the southern man and snake eagle. Owls often perch on them and unfortunately get electrocuted. Things like monkeys and snakes, if they're touching the earth part of the box and then touch those live wires and also get electrocuted. So they are a big problem for our wildlife. And we're hoping to use the southern band of snake eagle as a flagship to reduce this threat. Now EWT has an incident register. So they've been collecting reports of southern band of snake eagles being electrocuted over the years. Thus far, there have been four electrocutions of southern band of snake eagles since uh, 2012, if I remember correctly. So that is quite a high number when you consider we're estimating a population of around 50 birds. Very concerning. The other problem with these forested landscapes is it's very difficult to recover carcasses after something has been electrocuted. There are many scavengers around and they remove carcasses very quickly after an electrocution has happened. So we may be grossly underestimating this threat for our southern banded snake eagles. Now using the uh, distribution model that I showed you earlier, I did some work in mid-2018 looking at the potential risk of electrocution for these southern banded snake eagles in the northern Pozzo Natal landscape. And we came up with a bit of a threat matrix. So what we did was we looked at the transformer boxes where we knew that southern banded snake eagles had been electrocuted. And you can see that there are two down in St. Lucia. Unfortunately, one of those was responsible for claiming two birds. And then we had one up in Sudwana in the north. You can see the little red lightning bolts on your screen. 
Now, what we did was we highlighted any transformer box that fell within the 75% uh, or higher likelihood of um, Southern Banded Snake Eagles being present. So that is the absolute prime optimal habitat for these birds. We gave that a sort of high red rating. Anything that fell within the 50% um, box was given an orange rating, and anything outside of uh, the 25% index was given a yellow rating. So still risky, but not necessarily that risky to our southern man snake eagles. The other thing we did was all the boxes that fell within protected areas were also flagged. And so we then took all of that work and found that we were looking at 21 absolutely critically um, threatening transformer boxes and around 104 high-risk transformer boxes to our southern man snake eagles. I took this work over to um, Skifusa where the African Conference for Linear Infrastructure Ecology was happening in March 2019. And I presented to a room full of linear ecology scientists and industry players. And luckily, two of the people sitting in that room were high execs at ESCOM, who grabbed me after the talk and said, we need to talk urgently. Um, ESCOM, some of you might not know, is very involved in trying to mitigate the impacts on wildlife, despite their challenges of producing power for us. They actually do care a lot about the environment and they've done some really incredible work through their partnership with us as well as their partnership with EWT. Linking these two partnerships together, ESCOM stepped forward and said, we are prepared to um, do some work on these transformer boxes if you tell us which ones to tackle. And we will retrofit them with safety guards to stop animals being able to touch those live wires. Now what you can see on the left hand side of your screen is a transformer box where the jumper cables do not have any insulation on them. So if an animal is perched on that transformer box and touches one of those live wires, they are going to be electrocuted and probably killed. What they then do is they take the highly insulating rubber, they um, cover the entire live wire cable and they prevent anything from being able to touch those live wires when they retrofit these transformer boxes. And I'm going to show you quite an incredible story now. In March 2019, I presented my results at that conference, as I showed you already. By April 2019, I had meetings with ESCOM and the KwaZulu-Natal Operations Unit to start discussing the launch to mitigate these electrocution risk transformer boxes. In July 2019, I flew down to KwaZulu-Natal and met with some ESCOM executives to officially launch the Southern Man and Snake Eagle Electrocution Prevention Project. And in November 2019, they had committed to retrofitting 62 transformer boxes. And by November 2019, 94 of those had been retrofitted with protective measures. So we have been able to nullify this electrocution threat across a wide swathe of critical southern man and snake eagle habitat. And that is an incredible kudos to the people in that photograph on the left side of your screen there. ESCOM didn't need to step up and fix this threat as quickly as they did. They really, to their credit, despite all the challenges they do face, they really did step up. And I'd like to acknowledge the Angula Partnership, which is a partnership between the Middle Pit Wet and Trust, ESCOM and BirdLife South Africa. It's been going since 2004. And they were um, absolutely instrumental in helping us pull off this um, incredible conservation success. And we hope that we'll continue to retrofit more of those transformer boxes and make sure that that entire northern Zululand landscape is safe, not just for us and banded state eagles, but all wildlife throughout that northern Zululand region. So if we have a look ahead, you'll see that we have some knowledge gaps to close. I've already mentioned the telemetry one that is absolutely high on our list. Following that, we'll hopefully deploy some camera traps on some breeding um, events to try and understand what's going on with those chicks. And then of course, doing some ground truthing, some more ground truthing of that model and really getting a handle on our active territories of Southern Man and Snake Eagles and hopefully closing down that uh, population estimate um, uncertainty. We're hoping to launch the Zululand Snake Eagle or Birding Big Day, and I'm sure our raptors and large terrestrial birds project manager will get in touch with all of you to, to let you know when that's happening if anyone would like to make the trek out to Northern Zululand. As I said, we need to get a more scientifically informed population estimate. We need to accurately delineate where that suitable habitat still remains for these birds and make sure that it's being managed properly so that they can survive. 
And of course, we need to have a look at the global red list status. Currently, the species is listed as near threatened, which is the lowest threat category for species. Now, I'm sure if you have a look at all the science I've produced for you this evening, you can agree with me that the species should at least be considered endangered on a global platform. Now, I've been mentioning our Raptor and Large Terrestrial Bird Project Manager. I'd like to introduce all of you to Mr. Carl Walker, who will be taking over this project from me. And I will be helping supervise him to hopefully uncover some of the deep dark secrets of the Southern Man and Snake Eagle, as well as some, some of our other raptor species that Bird Life South Africa has under his portfolio. We're really excited to have Carl on board. He's an extremely talented raptor biologist whose passion is second to none when it comes to raptors. And we are very, very excited to see what he'll produce. And hopefully Carl can have a chat with your club in the upcoming years and tell you a little bit more about some of the work that we've been able to pull off in the upcoming months and years. So without further ado, I need to acknowledge many, many organizations, funders, partners, um, the main one being the Nguda Partnership, who helped fund a lot of our work. Um, as Anton mentioned earlier, the Raptor Research Foundation very kindly awarded us the Leslie Brown Memorial Grant to carry out some of our survey work. And uh, Dr. Troy Govender, Mr. Rudy Kruger, as well as Kishay and Chetty from ESCOM, who are instrumental in getting that um, Transformer Box project off the ground. I'm hugely grateful to Hugh Chittenden as well. He provided a lot of input and information on the species going into this project. And I'm really grateful to all of the other project managers who've been involved in this work prior to my arrival. So without uh, any further information from my side, if any of you have any questions, I'm going to ask that you just Put up the little blue raise your hand um, button. If you're not sure where to find that, it'll be under the participant list and you'll be able to um, ask me some questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much for listening and please stay safe during these uncertain times. Melissa? Yes. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. I uh, just thought maybe you'd want to explain how you go about um, trapping these birds uh, for the coming months. How do we go about doing this? Sure thing. Um, thanks for that, Carl. So uh, our Raptor and Large Threshold Bird Project Manager is actually on the line. <laughs> and uh, what we're going to be doing is um, when these birds are perching and waiting for prey to come along, they luckily um, 20% of their diet doesn't necessarily have to be reptiles, so I don't need my snake handling skills. But what we'll be doing is using what is called a Belchatri trap. So that is a big cage where we store um, one or two mice. They're very safe inside their cage. But on top of the cage, there are um, a whole lot of nooses where the bird can dive onto the mice, or at least try to dive onto the mice. Um, it'll then get caught in those nooses, and the bottom of the cage has a nice heavy weight. And that will then prevent the bird from being able to fly away. And we will be hiding nearby and run out and grab it. And then we will process it. And um, what we do is we take all of the measurements required for a typical sap ring, um, ringing exercise. So things like weight, wing length, um, tarsus length, head length. Um, we then fit the bird with a silver ring and we fit it with a small backpack. So this has a harness that goes around the bird's body. The device goes on its back. Um, exactly like a small school backpack and that bird is then able to fly around without too much um, interference from that little device and provide us with really important data on their movements. Thank you. Very no worries. Thanks Carl, good, good question. Are there any other questions? I think just unmute and we'll, we'll go for it. I see we've got some uh, written questions as well. I'm just going to tackle some of those. So Helen always said, um, is the 11 degrees Celsius cutoff for habitat linked to reptile activity and reptile slowing down when it, when it gets too cold? Um, thanks, Helen, for that question. Great question. We do think that this might um, be influencing them. So obviously, they need to be somewhere where it's warm and there's potential snake prey available throughout the year. 
um, as well as frog prey. So snakes and frogs require warm and wet. And so definitely that 11 degree cutoff could very much be linked to um, snakes being able to move around. Thanks for that good question. Melissa, Anton, can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can hear you, Anton. Great. Um, we were muted, so you didn't hear, you couldn't hear me and Elaine's applause with the um, installation of, of, of those um, transformer boxes. We've been hassled a lot about that in the low felt, um, yes. particularly with the, with the ground hornball. Um, yes. And um, it's, it's wonderful that, that ESCOM's coming to the party like that. Um, and I would just like to really thank you for, for a marvelous talk. I think it's it's new ground for us, and, and in the times that we're living in, I think this really has fantastic potential um, to get people on board. And I hope that in future we can get more of our members to come on board with talks like this because it's really exciting. Absolutely, and, and thanks so much, Anton, for the, for the opportunity. Um, BirdLife South Africa is actually in the process of launching a, a series like this where we'll get some of our team members to give talks like this and give a little bit more info about some of the work that we're doing on this Zoom platform. So hopefully you guys will be able to, to dial into those as well. But thank you so much for the opportunity to share this work with you guys. It, it really is appreciated. Is there anyone else that would like some to put some questions forward? I see someone's just asked, um, the talk's been recorded. It will be available. Um, I'll post it onto my YouTube account and I'll then share the link with Anton and he can pass it on to all of you. Uh, someone's also asking about the price of the trackers. So the units that we use, unfortunately, are made in Europe. Um, before COVID-19, we were looking at around 30,000 Rand per tracking device. And um, these devices weigh less than 30 grams. And they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they are really, really pricey little um, machines. But obviously the data that we get from them is really, really valuable. So we do have our work cut out for us in order to try and raise that funding. But um, yeah, we're looking at around 30 to 35,000 Rand per tracking device. Yeah, Melissa, it sounds to me as if everybody is done. It I'd really like so. to thank you. <laughs> hey? I said, yes, it, it seems so. Thanks, Anton. <laughs> Melissa, thanks for your time in the evening. It's really appreciated. And, and as I said, we'll be in contact and try and see how we can use you and or some of the other bird life people in future. If this thing Absolutely. continues for much longer, which it seems it will. No Bye, problem. Donkey. We really appreciate this. Hey. No problem. Thanks, Anton. Go well, and all the best to all of you out there. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank you. everyone. Thank you for your time. Keep well.